Hello there. Happy Friday to you. My name is Julie Hirschberg and after a week off, I'm back here in action at Reactive Physical Therapy and Wellness. We are an outpatient neurology specialty practice in the Los Angeles area. And our mission is to help people with neurologic diagnoses recover movement, their strength, their confidence in a way that actually changes the brain which is what we get to talk about today. I brought my brain model because we're gonna talk about the brain a little bit. It's something I get really excited about, especially talking with other therapists and uh, what we can do to really drive our therapy to truly make changes in the brain. So I mentioned last week I was off. I was um, camping with my family. Uh, we go camping every year. I love being outside. Uh, we paddleboarded all day with the dogs on the paddle boards. That was great. Swam in the lake, hiked down to the lake every day. And it's truly what my brain and my body needs to recharge. And while I was there, I couldn't turn off my brain entirely. I, I couldn't help but think about all of these sensory experiences that I get while camping that I don't get regularly at home. Like, really dirty feet, right? And, and my toes in the lake bottom and hiking on rocky surfaces, walking at night when there's no lights on. So many different um, sounds, smells, um, visual input and proprioceptive input. So many different sensory experiences. And I, my my body craves that and loves that. And um, it kind of, this camping trip kind of fed into my obsession, to be honest, with the sensory system. I, I just couldn't help but think about how this information is coming in, how it gets integrated to create this experience for me. And one of the things that I've been reading a lot about, and it's one of my favorite parts of the nervous system, is the sensory association cortex, which is also the posterior parietal lobe. So this week, I really wanted to share with you what I've been reading, learning, and thinking about this part of the brain. So hence the brain model. Um, what I wanted to start with is what exactly is the posterior parietal cortex? So let me bring this into view. This is um, a really cool model of the brain that we have um, for class at USC. Let me make sure that you can see it all here. So this is a cross section, like straight down the middle of the brain. So we're looking at the, the, the middle cross section. Um, it's so hard because it's backwards when I look at it for you here. But this is the front, the frontal lobe. This is the back. This is our occipital lobe here. And right in the middle, we have our primary motor cortex and our primary sensory cortex. And just behind the primary sensory cortex is the posterior parietal cortex. This area right in here, right here with my... Uh, with, uh, with a little uh, marker of, of um, Play-Doh. So it's between our primary sensory cortex and the visual cortex, which is really important because that is part of its function. It receives a lot of input from the primary sensory cortex and our visual cortex, as well as auditory cortex. So when we think about um, first, I want to say, like, here's where it's at in the parietal lobe. Second is what um, information does it bring in? So it integrates this sensory information. The main ones, as I said, visual system, auditory system, somatosensory system. And the idea, those things are integrated because the posterior parietal lobe is a major area that plays a role in localizing our body and where our body is in space. And I, I find this so fascinating and so important because we hear from a lot of people like, I don't know where I am in space, or I misjudged that, or I misstepped there. And that might be due to a posterior parietal lobe involvement, whether that's because of a stroke, or it might be because the connections are 
are off. And that can happen from a variety of reasons. So major sensory inputs into the posterior parietal cortex, but where, where does it output to? And so what's really neat about the posterior parietal cortex is it outputs to major areas that drive movement and motor function. So the motor cortex in the frontal lobe, like, like I was showing um, up here, the um, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, we've talked about that before, and other areas of secondary motor cortex and frontal eye fields, to name a few. And I will say with a lot of these things, this we're learning more and more, especially as our fMRI technology improves, uh, we're learning more and more about the inputs and outputs to these different areas of the brain, much more than when I was first in school, um, for example. So the, when we've got sensory inputs, we've got huge motor outputs and motor in, integration outputs um, from the posterior parietal lobe. And some studies in animals have actually shown that with stimulation in the posterior parietal cortex, you can get direct input to the spinal cord for movement, especially for um, arm movements and reaching and things like that. And that becomes really important for the key function. So that's the third thing to talk about with this um, sensory association or posterior parietal cortex is what does it do? And what do we mean by sensory association? So um, this is where the brain gets really cool and fun and it brings things together. And one of the best ways to um, show its function is to see what happens if there's a lesion in that area. So with a lesion in the posterior parietal cortex, we find uh, different kinds of agnosias. And one of those agnosias is astereognosis. And this is a, a really interesting um, finding. One way we test stereognosis is we give somebody with their eyes closed, we give them some objects to feel in their hands and to determine what that object is. So I might put a rubber band in your hand, you feel it, you're manipulating. So you can see that's beyond just, can I feel it? Like, or is my hand numb? That's not what we're testing in the posterior parietal cortex. We're, we're testing how does that feel when it's manipulated? Can I manipulate my hand to feel it over various surfaces and put together a picture of what that is and put a name to it as well? So it's really complex. Um, and it, with a lesion in, in the posterior parietal cortex, you can actually end up being able to feel things just fine, no numbness, but not be able to recognize an object placed in the hand like, like you would with stereognosis. So that's what we mean by that sensory association and complex integration. Other areas in the posterior parietal cortex, actually, Judy Deutsch, thank you very much. Um, she made a comment. We talked a little bit about this on Instagram last week, and she said, yes, motor imagery. And yes, so then, of course, I had to dive down that rabbit hole of motor imagery. And absolutely, the posterior parietal cortex has a role in motor imagery. And we know when we do motor, motor imagery, mental imagery, it can actually cause changes in the brain and improve somebody's function. Well, that activates parts of the posterior parietal cortex. So cool. So that perception of the body, the interpretation of our spatial relationships, so our body in space, our body image. So um, in our Instagram last week, we actually talked about how when a person can feel or sense disembodied or like their limb is not a part of them, as in the phenomenon of alien limb syndrome, um, or phenomena, um, that is the posterior parietal cortex. So feeling embodied, feeling in your body, um, learning tasks that involve coordination of the body in space, that's the posterior parietal cortex. The intention to move, I gotta tell you some really cool studies out there where they're looking at using the posterior parietal cortex as, um, a brain machine interface to drive a neural prosthesis. So let's say you lost a limb and they, um, I'm really simplifying it here, but they might hook up 
um, electronically through electrodes from your posterior parietal cortex to a prosthesis to drive arm movement, for example. So fascinating that that could come from this association area. So our intention to move can also be in the posterior parietal cortex. So it, when you look at all of those functions, very high level, very cognitive aspects of, of our action, and it, the posterior parietal cortex, a very rich source of um, signals and planning for us, which is why it might be used in the future for a neural prosthesis. So anyway, something coming down the line out of the research and understanding the function of this. So um, we talked about where it is, what are the inputs, outputs, what is the function, and we just started to hit on testing it because testing leads to treatment, right? So we talked about stereognosis, we talked about identifying objects in the hand. So we use very, not just rubber bands, but buttons and pins and pen caps and all kinds of things like that and have people identify them. One of my favorites is graphesthesia. So we test graphesthesia by drawing, and I typically take a tip of, a tip of my pen and drawing letters and numbers and having somebody identify them. So for example, I might draw an L and the person has their eyes closed and they have to identify it's an L or identify an S or identify a, a zero or an O. So that's how we would test graphesthesia and graphesthesia would be impaired in the posterior, if there was a posterior parietal cortex lesion. Um, graphesthesia may also be impaired, and this is what we see much more often, in, um, in somebody that might have a functional disorder or centralized pain, where their sensory discrimination has been impaired due to, to a pain syndrome or a lack of connection. So it might not be a focal lesion that's driving that impairment. Um, and then another is extinction. So this is another distinct part of the posterior parietal cortex in attention. So we test this with double simultaneous stimulation where we would touch somebody on the left side, the right side, or both at once. And they say right, left, or both. And if somebody um, is neglecting one side or extinguishing it is, is the word that we would use. They might feel the right side, they'd feel the left side, but when you do both at the same time, they would only perceive one touch. And um, that would be positive for ex extinction. So those are three big tests that we would use to test the function of the posterior parietal cortex. And um, then that would go right into treatment. So I've mentioned a few weeks in a row now because I'm obsessed with the sensory system. Um, we do a lot of sensory training here at Reactive and we might use graphesthesia, we might use stereognosis in our training. Um, there's a, a group who's done this a lot in, in the world of pain and has a systematic way to progress this kind of sensory discrimination training. And I made a cheat sheet for you um, to download. I'll post a link in here because I've been using this a ton, but there are, there's a really systematic way to progress treatment in um, sensory discrimination disorders. And I found it very helpful and really beneficial for, for people who have um, functional sensory loss and centralized um, pain. And good question here. Thanks for bringing that up, Pedro. I wonder if phantom limb pain would indicate a parietal cortex problem. So very interesting when we get in the world of, um, of pain and abnormal sensations, definitely the sensory map is impaired, primary somatosensory cortex, but then where these, um, where those sensory um, inputs get organized in the posterior parietal cortex? Absolutely. Now, I'm not an expert in phantom limb pain by any means. So um, I think we're gonna have to go into the literature there, Pedro, um, which will definitely send me down a, another rabbit hole. But it makes sense to me that the posterior parietal cortex would be 
like uh, indicated in um, as a piece of a problem with phantom limb pain. So thanks so much for bringing that up because now you got questions going in my mind. Um, and that sensory treatment can be a big part of um, rehabilitating somebody with phantom limb pain as well. So, um, so important in so many disorders. And I think I get obsessed with these things because one, I didn't really learn it in school. And um, two, I see it as a missing link in many of the disorders um, that I see where um, people just haven't addressed that piece. And when we do, we see really great improvements. Things like functional disorders, things like dystonia, um, things like central pain, CRPS type disorders, when we address some of the sensory component and bring that back to function, it becomes a really important part of, of recovery. So one, I, I, I will say one of the big reasons we've been jumping into this is because we're planning an upcoming weekend course coming up in October. And the sensory system, this posterior parietal cortex, good old brain model, um, is such an important piece of cultivating central nervous system connectivity. That's the theme of a course that's coming up in October. And what we're really looking at is how do we drive these connections through therapy? through physical therapy, through occupational therapy, and in particular with disorders like dystonia, like functional disorders, like sexual pain. So um, you're gonna be hearing a lot from me because I'm diving into the literature. I'm working very closely with my amazing colleague, um, Brittany Kim and her team here to really put together frameworks and understand how we can best approach uh, these cases to provide really great recovery and promote neuroplasticity. That's that's really the end result. So uh, thanks so much for joining me on this journey as we nerd out with neuroanatomy, apply it to cases and um, catch me next week. We're going to actually talk about how to do some of the sensory training in the telehealth world. This is, these are questions that we were brainstorming over the kitchen table yesterday at lunch with um, how do we do this in dystonia, in telehealth? And we had some great brainstorming and discussion. So we're going to talk about that next week. And I hope you'll join me. And uh, until then, have a great weekend. And thanks so much for joining me today.